Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Adam. I'm the senior minister here at Corinth. Um, if you're a guest, I want to say welcome and thank you so much for coming out to be with us today. Um, I would love nothing more than a chance to say hello to you at the end of the service. And so I'll be hanging out in the Next Steps room, which is out those doors and to, your, uh, to my left. And we'd love for you to stop in there. I've got a gift for you. We'd just love a chance uh, to meet you. So please do that today after um, services. I also want to say hello to those of you who are watching us online. We hope you're having a great day wherever you find yourself, uh, whether you're wrapping up from fall break or on your way back. We're squeezing in the last few hours that you can. Uh, we hope you're having a fantastic time. And we also know, too, that most people will check us out online before they ever step foot in this place. And so we think next Sunday would be a great Sunday to be your first Sunday uh, here. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Well, uh, there are words that all of us don't like or that some of us don't like. They're just certain little like trigger words or words that we hear. And it's just like, Man, I really just don't like that, that word. Uh, one of my words is a four-letter word. And so I'm going to start off with a four-letter word in church today. So I hope you'll, you'll forgive me for just a second. But my four-letter word that I absolutely hate is wait. W-A-I-T. I hate waiting. Anybody with me? Anybody bad waiters? I absolutely hate waiting. Um, I am the kind of guy that um, will turn right whenever he's supposed to go left, and I would rather drive three miles out of the way because moving in the wrong direction is better than sitting to me. You know, it's just like, let's just keep it moving. I change grocery store lines like it's nobody's business. Um, yesterday, we were at Kroger uh, picking up um, a bunch of candy for trunk or treat because it's 50% off with the digital coupon. Just want you guys to know that. And um, we had loaded up a cart and we had it there and uh, my wife Jennifer she had taken her hand off the cart and it was just like oh no we can be in that line right there it's like and then we tried to move and somebody beat us to the spot you know I'm the one that's in line watching and making sure that other lines aren't going quicker and if they are I will move over there right and that's just the way it is the longest five minutes of my day are the day whenever my coffee maker is percolating and doing its thing it's like would you hurry up Okay, I am just a terrible, terrible waiter. It runs in my family, believe it or not. Uh, my great-grandpa, his name was Roscoe Watts. Isn't that a great name? Roscoe. Roscoe was a homesteader out in Colorado, lived in the late 1800s, and he lived to be 93 years old. And one of our fa family's favorite stories about uh, great-grandpa Roscoe was there was a day he was trying to cook eggs on his uh, wood stove, okay, because that's, that's what they use. And the wood stove was not hot enough and not cooking the eggs quick enough for him. Now, those of you who cooked eggs, eggs do not take that long to cook. And so you can kind of already hear the impatience that is there. And so Roscoe saw that off to the side, there was a big canister of kerosene fuel. And he had a thought, thought, here it is. This fire is not hot enough. You know, it'll make it hotter kerosene fuel. And so what he did is he took all that fuel and he dumped it into that fire and literally it backfired on him. And they had to take him to the emergency room where he had to wait to be seen for a skin graft. Okay, that, that's exactly what it is. And so it just kind of runs in my family. We're just not the most patient people. But I think a lot of us are, are, are just kind of impatient people. Uh, we, we just don't like waiting on things. Whether you're waiting on the cable company to show up from 12 a.m. to 7 p.m., you know, that little window that they, they give you, you know, it's just like, oh my goodness, whether it's waiting for the phone call from the customer or from your boss, um, you know, whether it's waiting for the doctor, you know, you go into the doctor's office and you go to the waiting room and you wait there for 30 minutes, even though you were on time. Time. And then they take you and they take you to another room where what do you do? You wait, right? That's what you do. You just keep waiting or waiting for an app to download. You know, sometimes those things take forever. And I'll date myself here. And some of us here, you, you, you'll remember this. Do you remember the days of Napster? Okay, whenever you had to download songs, it was like four days later, you got that one Dave Matthews song because of that, you know, that dial up internet. Okay, we, we just hate waiting. And so uh, what I thought we'd do is just take a real quick quiz. And so I need you all to be honest with me. So say, I'll be honest. Okay, I believe you. All right, all right, here we go. So how many of you all have ever driven through a gas station parking lot to avoid a red light? You can raise your hand there. Okay, some of you are truthful. Some of you are liars, all right? Um, how many of you all believe that a yellow light means speed up, not slow down? Absolutely. And it's like, if you're in front of me, you better believe that too, all right? Because um, I will make you believe that one. All right, how many of you in the grocery store, you find the shortest line? Okay, you're, you're like me and you just go hopping around. And on this one, I just want to tell you, you should do that. Um, because they have found that the average person spends three years of their life waiting in line. Okay? So whenever you're at the store next time, just cut in front of somebody and say, I don't have time to waste. All right? I, I'm not going to waste my life waiting in line. We, we hate waiting. It is so frustrating to just be caught in this just period of just where we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. Here's the thing. Th those things are small things, aren't they? 
And those are just kind of little minor annoyances. And, you know, we might be a little frustrated because there's a little inactivity going on or we're just kind of sitting around waiting on something. But, but there are other things that aren't just like frustrating to wait on. But how about this? They're infuriating to wait on. Or, or they can be debilitating to wait on. Some of you all know this all too well, don't you? Because you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. You've been praying and praying and praying. And nothing that seems to be happening, right? You're waiting. You know, the thing that you want most is a spouse. You, you want somebody to, to love and to share your life with. And you've been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And waiting and waiting and waiting. Nothing's happened. Or maybe you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter in your house. And you've been praying and praying and praying that God would call them back to the faith and the things that you taught them from a very young age that they would return to them. Maybe uh, you have been waiting for God to heal somebody. And maybe it's cancer or maybe it's some other kind of disease that's just debilitating them. And, and you have prayed and you have prayed and you have prayed and you wait and you wait and you wait. See, sometimes we wait for things, and it's just like, ah, whatever, it's just kind of frustrating. But these things can be a little debilitating, can be a little infuriating, because sometimes the things that we are waiting for are weighty, aren't they? They're just a little bit bigger. They're just a bit heavier. They're just a bit more to them than what those other things are. And what gets really frustrating is whenever you're able to look out and to be able to see what life would be like if those things were just to come true. And you can see where things need to be, but the problem is that that's all the way over there, and you're all the way over here. And so in the midst of it, you're just waiting and waiting and waiting. The, the hardest wait is the wait between here and there. Sometimes the things that we're waiting for are very weighty. Today we're in a part three of our, our series on the life of David, King David. And uh, he's a man after God's own heart. And uh, if you've never heard David's story, this is a, this is a fantastic series to be a part of because uh, you can be introduced to just an, a, an incredible guy that had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. But in, through it all, he was faithful uh, to God and he was called a man after God's own heart. And in it, we're looking at his life and how he became king and just learning some lessons from him. And today, as we pick up in part three, what we're going to see is that David is in between here and there. And he's in a waiting season, and it's a really heavy wait for him. Because what has happened is there was a king in the land of that day of Israel. His name was Saul, and Saul was tall. He looked the part but lacked the heart. He was the guy that had been appointed king, and yet it all just kind of fell apart for him. And so God calls Samuel, one of his prophets, out of retirement and says, Hey, I need you to go to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint and appoint my next king. And so we, we looked at this in part one. First Samuel chapter 16, uh, verse 13, this is what it says. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brother. Others, talking about David. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And that's a pretty good day, isn't it? Everybody say good day. Good day. That's a good day. David's in between 8 and 15 years old at this point. So we'll just call him 13, you know. And, and he's about that age. And so here it is. Old man comes up, anoints him, and says, you are going to be king. That's, that's a pretty cool thing. But the thing is, David doesn't get to become king for quite a while. In fact, it's not until we get to 2 Samuel chapter 5 that we see that this actually comes to fruition. Whenever it says this in verses 3 and 4, When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. And David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. Let's just do a little bit of math real quick here. Now, this is in your notes. So from anointing to ascending, there are 20 chapters. In between there. And that represents anywhere from 15 to 20 years of David's life. 15 to 20 years of just waiting in line for his new job. Now, I don't know if you can imagine this, guys, but imagine that your boss called you in and he sits you down and he says, you know what? I see so much potential in you. I think that you are the future of our company. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to appoint you to be the second in command or I'm going to, you're going to be the one that's going to take over and you're going to lead this new division and you're going to take it because you are the one that can see it. You have the vision. You are the one that can take this company where it needs to be. And you're like, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what it is. You call your wife. You call your mom. You call your dad. You're like, it's happening. I got the promotion. And it's just, everything's where it needs to be. And then you wait. How long are you willing to wait? 
You wait a week and nothing's been said. You wait a month, nothing's been said. You know, six months, nothing's happened yet. You're a year into it. You're sitting there going, okay, all right. They're just grooming me. You know, they're training me to become the boss that I'm going to need to be. But then 20 years later, what would you be thinking? This ain't ever going to happen. This isn't going to happen. He lied to me. This isn't the way it's going to be. So David, that's where we kind of find David. Now, it's really easy for us to read that and go, ah, it's only 20 chapters. You know, but you know who didn't know it was 20 chapters? David. You know, David didn't know that because he didn't get a chance to read the 20 chapters beforehand because he's living those chapters out. He never read this story. He was living this story. And the only thing that David is thinking during this time is, am I going to live or am I going to die? Because Saul's trying to kill him. He's being sent out into battle and all these things. We look at this as just as like David's pre-king days. David is not looking at it like that. He's in the middle of a wait, and it was a heavy wait for him, waiting to be able to see what God had actually come to, come to be, what God had promised him was going to happen. So that gives you just a really simple little principle here that you can be appointed and anointed but still have to wait. And that's what David had to do. You know, and probably year one or year two, he's probably like, yeah, that's all right. I'm only 15. I'm only 16 years old. I probably shouldn't be king now anyway. But then it just work, goes on and on and on. Wouldn't it be great to know what David was thinking at that time? Actually, we do, because uh, David wrote an awful lot of the Psalms. He wrote 73 of them. And through those, we can hear his prayers. We can hear what it is that he had to say. Like Psalm 143, verses 7 and 8. This is what he says. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face uh, from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Answer me quickly, God. I, I need an answer now. You're hiding your face from me. And let the morning bring me word. You know what he's saying there? Tomorrow would be a great day for you to answer this prayer. Anybody ever said that to God? Man, God, it would be great if you would answer this prayer soon. Tomorrow. How's tomorrow morning work? 7 a.m.? I'll be up by then. That's what David's saying. Uh, Psalm 59, verse 4. I know you've prayed this prayer. Wake up, God. See what is happening and help me. Sometimes it feels like God's asleep at the wheel. And you're just waiting. See, for David, this wait was a heavy wait. But what David couldn't see was that in this waiting season, what God was doing is he was shaping him and crafting him into be the man that he needed him to be. See, Saul just was appointed king. He wasn't crafted to become the king that God needed. It was this oh, guy looks like it. He's tall, dark, and handsome. Let's put him in charge. It looks like he can chop people's heads off. That He looks like a good king. But with David, God is saying, no, let's slow this down a little bit. We're not just going to appoint somebody. I'm going to work through somebody. I'm going to shape him. And so David is being shaped. He's being crafted. He's being formed. He's being taught. He's being created into this king that God needed for his people. Now, over these 20 chapters, David's going to learn a lot of important lessons. He's going to learn you know, how to be brave and how to have courage. Like he goes up against a giant like Josh was talking about last week, and he takes Goliath down. He learns things like submission to authority, okay? Uh, because King Saul, even though he's a bad boss, and he's a bad king, he's a bad leader, David still submits to him. We'll look more at that in depth here in just a, in a couple of weeks. So he learns leadership throughout this. Because all these, it's a fascinating thing. David kind of goes off and he's on the run from Saul, but all these misfits of, of men and just start showing up and following him. And it's like David has the island of misfit toys and he gets them all together and he creates this incredible army that defeats nations. So he learns to lead. He also learns humility. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that happens. We won't get a chance to actually dive into it. It happens in a few chapters here to where um, David is on the run from Saul, and so he's, he's going to hide, and he runs off to the city of Gath. Now, the city of Gath, the reason why this is so important is Gath is where Goliath was from. And so he's already killed their giant, but for him to find safety, he has to go to the, the city to where he had just taken out, taken out their biggest warrior. So what kind of reception do you think they're going to give him? Well, they, like, you cut off his head, we'll cut off yours, you know, is what they're thinking. And so David has to humiliate himself, and so what he does is he starts drooling down his beard and acting like a crazy man so they will not kill him. This is the guy who is going to be king over all the nation of Israel, has drool running down his beard, acting like a fool. He had to humiliate himself. He learned humility through this. But maybe the biggest lesson that he learned through it all was how to trust how to trust God in all of this, that even in this period of inactivity, David learned that God was still active, no matter what it looked like. 
that God was still working, that his promise was still there, and that God would make true what he promised he would do. And I think today that as we consider just this period of time in, in David's life, that that's something that we all might need to remember today. We might need to remember that even though we can't see it or we may not see it, God is doing something in your waiting. That while you wait, God is not asleep at the wheel. He is active and he is doing something and he is working to shape you, to teach you, to form you, to develop you into the man or to the woman that he wants you to be so that it can be said about you in days to come that you were a man or you were a woman after God's own heart. See, you might want to write this down. This is what I have. Waiting may not be what we want, but it may be just what we need. So with that being said, I want to give you two life lessons today from this time of David's life, two life lessons that we can walk with uh, this morning. Life lesson number one is this. Don't waste the wait. Don't waste it. There are two things that will act like fertilizer for your faith. One is suffering, and the second is waiting. And it just so happens that we hate both of them. But you will never grow more than whenever you are in a period of suffering and pain and trial. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. And you will never grow more whenever you are in a period of waiting and things are just going a little bit slower than the way that you would want them to. They are great catalysts for our faith. Uh, waiting is the fertile ground of growth when it comes to our faith. We see this time and time again in, in the Old Testament. There's a guy by the name of Abraham, and Abraham is told that he is going to be the father of a great nation, that God is going to give him so many descendants, they'll be like the stars in the sky, the sand on the beach, that you will never be able to count them all. But he tells him that at the time whenever he's 75 years old and his first kid isn't born until he's... 99 years old. He had to wait decades to see that take place. Joseph um, was beloved by his father and he get, got an amazing technicolor dream coat from his dad. And, and his brothers hated him. They sell him into slavery. He gets sold into slavery. He, he, he does a great job there, but then he gets thrown into prison. He is in prison and in slavery for 13 years before he ascends to second highest in the land of Egypt. Jacob um, had a girl that he loved. Her name was Rachel, and he had to wait seven years of hard labor to marry her, and he didn't even get to marry her first. He had to marry the ugly sister first, and then he got to marry Rachel, but he waited seven years for that. Moses waited 40 years watching his father-in-law's sheep, 40 years in the desert, and just out there watching sheep, working for his father-in-law, which doesn't that sound like fun, you know, working for his father-in-law 40 years before he gets sent to go be the deliverer of Israel. Jesus himself was 30 years old before he came out and he said, hey, I am the son of God, and he started his own ministry. So what that kind of leads me to think is that the longer the wait, the greater the weight of what he's preparing for you to do. That the longer you and I have to wait, it means the greater the wait, the greater the magnitude of what it is that he is preparing for us to do. So don't waste that waiting time. Make the most of it and develop yourself and allow God to develop you into the person he needs you to be. It's about uh, 11 years ago, almost 10 years ago now, uh, it'll be 10 years in January, um, that I became senior minister here at, at Corinth Christian Church, and Don Hardison stepped aside to do a part-time role. I was youth minister, and then we did a transition thing, and that, that whole transition lasted about 18 months. You know, some of that was public stuff, some of that was just, you know, you know in, in private kind of stuff, and I, I remember after Josh had come in as our youth minister, and um, so I got to this place to where I didn't have youth ministry duties, and I wasn't preaching every week, and so it's kind of, I felt like I was in this no man's land, and I've already told you patience is not my my gift. And so I remember calling my mentors and time and time again, like, I don't know what to do. I don't have anything to do. I don't know. And every single time they would tell me, and I said, Adam, don't waste this time. You work on allowing God to develop you into the kind of preacher, into the kind of man, into the kind of leader that your church is going to need for decades to come. Don't waste this time. And don't get impatient. You just, you embrace it. So that's wisdom for all of us to take. Don't waste the weight, do something with it. If you're single and you're like, oh my goodness, the thing I want more than anything is, is a spouse or maybe it's just, you just want a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You're like, that. I don't even need to get married yet. I just, I just want somebody that, you know, just to be a part. Don't waste this time while you're waiting. If God hasn't sent anybody yet, here, here's the thing. You just work on becoming the kind of person that the person that you're looking for is looking for. You, you with me on that? Okay, you know, and so it, like, if you're like, oh, I just, I want to find somebody to marry, here's the question. So is the per kind of person that you want to marry, would they want to marry you and the kind of person you are right now? 
If not, then start to work on your character. Develop that and allow yourself to be shaped and shifted into who God wants you to really be. If you're married, it's like, oh, we want to have kids. We want to have kids. And that's great. But if you're in that kind of waiting period and it's just not working out right now, then here's the thing. You work on yourselves and make sure that you are the same or that you are the kind of godly parents that your kid is going to need. And you work and you develop that. If it's at work and it's like, hey, I need a promotion. I want to do this. I got these ideas. I got this stuff I want to do. You work on yourself and say, you know what? It's not happening right now. So I'm going to be the best worker I can. I'm going to work on my character. I'm going to work on my skills. I'm going to work on my devotion. And I'm just going to do that. And you just embrace the weight and you don't waste it. Don't waste the weight. You allow God to do uh, what he needs to do in you. Because here's the truth. God is far more concerned with who you are becoming than what you are doing. He wants to shape you and to shift you and to form you into what it is that you can do for him. Psalm 27 verse 14 says this. It says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Wait patiently for the Lord. Now, guys, a lot of times uh, we fight against this because we're men of action. We want to do stuff. We want to do it. I just want to point out to you that one of the most brave things and courageous things that you can do is to wait on the Lord. And to wait for him to do what only he can do. Life lesson number two is this. Don't try to skip the wait. Don't try and skip it. Uh, there is a great temptation we can face to speed things up, to try to give God a hand with his plan. You know, it's just like, God, you need a little help with this, and it's going a little slower than probably what it should. So I'm going to just jump in here, and I'm going to take things over for just a little bit, and I don't think I need to wait anymore. And I, We're just going to go with this. This is exactly why Saul lost his throne. Okay. Uh, Saul uh, had a great battle that he was getting ready to go into, and there's a sacrifice that needed to be done. And so uh, he calls Samuel and says, hey, I need you to get over here to do a sacrifice. But Samuel's old. He's a little slower, so it takes some time. And, and it comes up to where it's like, oh, we've got an opening in the battle. We can take them out. We can wipe them out right now. And so they're like, well, we need to do a sacrifice. So Saul just says, here, here we go. You, you bring it to me. I'll do it right now. And he does the sacrifice. And sure enough, as soon as he does that, Samuel walks up and he's like, what did you just do? You know, and he's like, I did the sacrifice. You're like, and he's like, because of this, this is a no, no, big no, no, uh, uh-uh, uh, kind of thing. God is going to take your throne from you. That's exactly what happened. He tried to skip the weight, and this is exactly what David did not do. Okay, David was just the opposite. He embraced it, and he did not try to skip past it because what he did is, even though he had opportunities to try and take the throne forcibly to take Saul's life, he knew that he was appointed. He knew that he had been anointed. David said, "You know what? No, 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 no. It's not. That's not how it's going to do. I'm going to wait on God because it's about God's will. It's about God's plan, and it's in His time that this is all going to work." And so he didn't try to skip the wait. You have to embrace Don't try and skip the weight. And so if you are single and it's like, man, I can't find a boyfriend. I can't find a girlfriend. I can't find a spouse. You know, the reason why I can't find a spouse is because, you know, one of these things, you know, like God asked me to do, I, they're just kind of in the way, you know. And so I'm going to give up on my principles, give up on purity, and I'll just start sleeping around and I'll do those things because then I'll be able to find somebody. And after I find them, then I'll go back to what God wants me, me to do. Or, you know, maybe your, your marriage just isn't going the way it needs to go, and it's just like, oh, this isn't working out. And so you know, it's like, oh, this is just going to end in a divorce. It's going to end bad. And so, but God wants me to be married, so what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and I'll find my next spouse now, and I'll start working on it now while I'm still married to the other one. Or, or you know, maybe it's like you're at work and the promotion, you're unappreciated, nobody's paying attention to you. It's like, well, obviously this waiting game's just not working. So I'm going to start cheating, bending the rules a little bit, twisting the system, spreading some rumors about some people, and I'm going to start leveraging things in my way so that I can kind of get past this waiting time. Friends, listen, do not break God's will to help him accomplish his plan. You cannot break his will and help him accomplish his plans. That's not going to work for you. That's a bad idea. Everybody say bad idea. That's a bad idea. It will not work out for you. Don't break God's will to help him accomplish his plans because you can't do it. If you are in a waiting season, listen, it's for a reason. God is doing something. And what if you miss out on becoming who God wants you to be because you tried to skip the wait and you tried to fast forward things instead of embracing what it is that God has for you? So instead of skipping it, here's what I would say. Go ahead and release control. Surrender to his will but also surrender to his timing. And in time, you will see him move. Psalm 37, verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Don't skip the wait. 
He wants to do something in you before he does something through you. Bottom line this morning would just be this. This isn't original with me, but I couldn't find who it was original with. It just says, God's delays are not God's denials. Listen, friends, God is seldom early, but he is never late. And in his time, he will do what he needs to do. And while you are in this season of waiting, you may not be where you want to be. You may be stuck over here and there is where you want to be. You may be right in the middle and you don't even know. But don't waste this waiting season. Let God do in you what needs to be done. Let him develop you and shape you and form you. And don't try and skip it. Embrace his will and embrace his time. Because his delays aren't his denials. He will He will bring to fruition what he has promised. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, we are asking for your help today because this is a hard thing for a lot of us. Because we are impatient and we want things to go faster than they are going. And sometimes, God, you just you slow us down. And sometimes you slow us so you can grow us. And so help us to, to embrace that today. And for those of us who are in the middle of a waiting season, God, and uh, we're, we're struggling right now. Our impatience is, is firing on all cylinders. I'm asking you today to give us the strength, give us the bravery, give us the courage to slow down and to wait and to trust you. And to know that in your time, your will will be done. And so help us to see, God, if there are things that you want to work in us right now more than you want to do through us. And help us to trust you in this. God, for for those of us here today, and uh, today is hard because we know, we know, we know, we know, we have tried to skip the wait. And we've tried to help you out with your plan. We've tried to give you a hand. And uh, maybe we've even broken your will to try to accomplish your will. So God, we're asking for forgiveness today. That you would that you would hear our, our cry for forgiveness and our, and our longing to be made whole again. And we're asking that you would uh, help us to learn to wait and to wait well on you. And help us to see that a, 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 waited, a waiting season isn't a wasted season. That you are doing something in us. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have in him. That he gave his life for us to save us. And we pray this all in his name.